and happy holidays and uh, glad to see you here on this nice foggy chilly evening. Um, welcome to the, uh, the last Frontiers of Science lecture of 2019, um, starting 2020 next year, I can't believe it. Um, on behalf of uh, my college, I'm the Dean of the College of Mines and Earth Sciences and the College of Science and Peter Trappa, I don't know if Peter's here at the moment, but um, on behalf of Peter and I, welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker um, this evening, Dr. Kate Mayer. And uh, Dr. Mayer is a professor of Earth System Science at Stanford University and a senior fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment. She uh, received her BS from Dartmouth and her MS and PhDs from Berkeley. And uh, in her relatively short career, she has received numerous national and international awards for teaching, research, and service. Um, her uh, scientific work focuses on fundamental interactions between water and minerals that regulate climate, form soils, control water quality, and allow life to flourish on Earth. These skills allow her to focus on questions ranging from paleoclimate and paleoenvironmental reconstruction, uh, including um, doing studies well before instrumental records uh, were available, in order uh, to understand sustainability of current landscapes and environments. Uh, she's broadly published and widely cited in the literature, um, but more importantly, I think, she also publishes in popular outlets like Smithsonian Magazine, which makes her work accessible to the general public. Um, and perhaps equally important, um, she was a multi-time national champion road cyclist um, while she was in graduate school. So um, I think all I did was try to study and keep up. But um, And speaking of cycles, <laughs> to use a pun, uh, she's going to give a presentation today on the evolution of Earth's carbon cycle. So please welcome Dr. Kate Mayer. So let you Can you all hear me? Great. Let me switch sides here and we'll get started. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. It's an honor and a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you all tonight. Uh, as Daryl mentioned, I'm a biogeochemist, and I study the interactions between organisms, microbes, and plants, and things like soils and sediments, earth, and t earth materials. And those two-way interactions are sort of like an underground economy, and so I study the underground economy of earth, and this economy is really important for water quality, healthy soils, the carbon cycle. And so for a long time when I would introduce myself to people who are not academics, I would tell them that I studied the carbon cycle because I thought that sounded interesting and important and, and something we could talk about. And not a lot of people asked me very many questions. That approach to introducing myself wasn't working. And so I, I, I was really curious about it. And so finally I was talking to a science journalist and she said, you know, the thing about the carbon cycle is that every time I try to look at it and understand it, the first thing that comes up on Google is one of those diagrams with arrows going every which direction, giant numbers that seem meaningless to me. Yeah, people have seen those? Yeah. Um, and I just, I can't get my head around it, and it just seems so complicated and kind of boring in some ways. And so it really caused me to reflect on, you know, this carbon, the carbon cycle that scientists are so fascinated by. We're not telling a story about how important it is. We're also not getting the message across that it actually works in some really simple ways. And so what I want to share with you tonight is both my fascination with the carbon cycle and also just some simple ways to think about it um, in terms of this, the, the, the processes that go on. And so we're going to demystify those awful carbon cycle diagrams. And, you know, one of the things that I think is most important to think about is that as far as we know, the carbon cycle that we have on our planet is unique. Earth is the only planet we've found so far that has a carbon cycle. And it's had four billion years to sort of, twi to sort of tweak and shape and, and work with this carbon cycle to make it into something that, that has enabled us to have liquid water on Earth for four billion years. And that's really the first prerequisite to life is, is liquid water. And so I'll say a little bit more about looking for other planets, but this is probably the most interesting and unique um, aspect of the carbon cycle. 
And so to, to really dig into what it means to have four billion years of carbon cycle, I want to just ask you to go on a space travel mission with me. And so pretend you're interstellar travelers and you're putt-putting along through the universe in your spaceship and you discover a planet and you're pretty excited. It's icy, looks like this. And so you send out your, your probe to go and bring you back pictures of the Earth's surface. What is going on down on this icy planet? And as those images from the probe come back, you see that there are mountains. Mountains are really important for planets. I'll tell you why in a minute. And there are massive glaciers moving ice through these mountain belts and churning them up. As you go towards the equator, you see that on that ice, there's also liquid water. It's flowing, it's moving, it's ponding on the surface. And so this liquid water is also really important in terms of discovering a planet. And so it turns out this planet we're exploring is not some strange exoplanet. Oops, going the wrong way here. It's Earth, 660 million years ago, when the planet went through what we call a snowball Earth phase. And we think that the entire planet was covered in ice for about 50 million years. And so it's fascinating to think about that. And you know, one of the questions is, okay, well, how do we know? And so this is the other part I love about being a geoscientist, is that really we're, we're breaking Earth's codes. We can't time travel and go back to 660 million years ago and, and see these glaciers. We have to piece them together. And so one of the, the ways that we, we do that is by going evidence over time. And so you know, the first idea about Snowball Earth is a relatively recent idea. It was put forward in the late 1990s as a suggestion, and that was based on some strange rocks. And then people found more strange rocks, and then they brought geochemistry in and figured out the chemistry of these strange rocks. They saw these isotopic variations in carbon that gave them some ideas, and then they got ages on the strange rocks, and they realized, oh my god, all of these strange rocks are the same age. And then they started using models to ask the question of, could we actually freeze Earth over? What would that look like? And it turned out that there were some ways that they could do that. And so it became this idea that we really did have these snowball Earths. And you know, to just orient you into what was going on during these snowball events, this is uh, the geologic eras are down here. And what I'm showing here are periods where we had snowball Earth events. And so the one we're talking about is this one in the late Neoproterozoic. And you know, we don't know exactly what Earth's conditions, what Earth's atmosphere looked like early on. But I just want to give you kind of a broad brush view of what we think Earth was like during its early years. And so what I've done is just take a, an estimate of our relative concentrations of atmospheric gases. And what you can see is that early on, Earth had quite a bit of CO2, it had quite a bit of methane, but almost no oxygen in the atmosphere and during early Earth. And so it's important to remember that the sun was about 30% uh, less, the radi radiative forcing from the sun was about 30% less than it is today. And so we needed a lot of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to create the conditions that we know existed during that time. So we started out with no oxygen, we went through this great oxidation event where we had the onset of oxygenic photosynthesis and that changed the entire atmosphere of the planet, which is crazy to think about. Microbes changed the atmosphere of the planet in a huge way. And so once we started to get oxygen, methane concentrations went down and we went into this phase called the boring billion, right? Nothing happened really for a billion years. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, and so then as we, we came into this Neoproterozoic snowball event, things started to change and they really never went back to the boring billion, thank God. Um, but here you can see we started to have more oxygen, even more oxygen in the atmosphere. CO2 levels went on this long-term, pretty permanent decline um, and methane became less abundant. And so just to zoom in on this snowball event, um, this is now, this is called the Sturtian and the Marinoan glaciations. And so this lasted for a long time. It lasted for 50 million years. Um, and then we had a brief, brief interlude and then we went back into one more snowball. And those were the last snowballs, fortunately, that we've had. We've had, of course, what we call ice house and greenhouse climates. Ice house climates where we have snow and ice, uh, ice caps forming and greenhouse climates where we don't have um, appreciable ice caps. And so those are some of our big tra climate transitions. 
what caused this to happen? And it's really simple. It was a massive disruption of the carbon cycle. And I want to explain to you how that happened because it's really key to understanding how the carbon cycle works. And what was going on at the time is that we had this massive supercontinent called Rodinia, and Rodinia was starting to break up. And when Rodinia broke up, we started to form all these small continents. And one of the things that that did, because back in the Neoproterozoic, we didn't have land plants, we had very simple organisms, and we didn't have the same patterns in precipitation that we have today, where about 50% of the rain that falls on the land surface is recycled back into the atmosphere. And so when we had a big Rodinia, we probably had a lot of desert. And so as the, continents broke, as the continent broke up and we formed these small continents, we started to have a lot of tiny watersheds and we had more rainfall on the continents. And what happened is that as that rainfall interacted with the rocks, it actually sucked CO2 out of the atmosphere. Oops. And so now, how, does, how do rocks remove CO2 from the atmosphere, right? That's something that like, most of us haven't heard of, and I hadn't heard of it until I started to study geology. And so I want to explain to you how that happens and just give you a sense for what this early Earth carbon cycle might have looked like. And I just put some guesses on here as to what the numbers might have been. But what I'm showing here is the reservoirs of carbon on the Earth's surface and in the deep crust. In terms of a really weird number, which is petagrams of carbon, um, which would also equal a billion tons of carbon, or a gigaton of carbon, or 3.664 billion tons of CO2. And so I don't, we were just talking about this earlier, and I don't have a great number for you, but a ton of CO2 is probably close to, I don't know, an African elephant. So you can kind of think of like, if the average US household emits about 20 to 40 tons of CO2 a year, it's about you know, maybe 20 or so African elephants is kind of the equivalent there. And so here we're talking about you know, billions of tons of carbon. So a lot of carbon. And you know, so we didn't have fossil fuels yet, so we didn't have that carbon reservoir. Um, we didn't really have soils. We probably had you know, maybe very simple organisms on the Earth's surface. We didn't have plants, and we might have had a little bit of organic carbon in soils, but this number will go up considerably as we go through Earth history. Um, of course, we didn't have plants, and so we can add, you know, the main reservoir of carbon in the Earth at the time was really this ocean atmosphere system, and we tend to refer to them together because they're so strongly coupled. And so we have you know, an ocean that exchanges pretty quickly, so it kind of maintains equilibrium between the atmosphere. And so the main source of CO2 we had at the time was CO2 coming from volcanoes at about 0.1 gigatons per year. That CO2 goes into the atmosphere and it falls out, it mixes with, dissolves in water and falls as rain onto watersheds at the Earth's surface. And as that water enters the rocks, it dissolves them and releases cations and alkalinity. And that cation and alkalinity is then shepherded by the rivers to the ocean where it forms calcium carbonate and limestone, which gets buried and returned to the deep crust. And so the, um, the, the numbers to really compare here, really the, the flux coming from volcanoes, 0.1, and this riverine flux of 0.3. And the other thing about this 0.3 is that the Two-thirds of it is coming from the dissolution of limestone, which actually doesn't affect CO2, and the other 0.1 gigatons are, is coming from the dissolution of silicate minerals, and that's what's pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. And so I just want to explain how that works, and it's a little bit of chemistry, but I've kept it pretty simple. And so this is what I think of as the CO2 pipeline and the weathering reactor. It's this little reactor that's sort of stuck in the CO2 pipeline. And so as I mentioned, the CO2 gets dissolved in rainwater, it falls onto a watershed, and that watershed, the water circulates through the watershed and it reacts with the rocks. And so we talked about calcium carbonate or limestone. The other type of rock type you can have is something like a granite, a basalt, where you have silicate minerals that also contain calcium and magnesium. And so when the CO2 reacts with these minerals, they're effectively a base. And so you get bicarbonate and calcium, which are the components you need to form limestone. And so in the oceans, we get carbonate precipitation and burial, and then we return this calcium carbonate back to the Earth, where it may actually be returned to the atmosphere through volcanoes. So we have this very long time scale plate tectonics on top. And you know, in today's Earth, it takes about 300,000 years to go from uh, CO2 all the way back to calcium carbonate burial. 
And you know, just to zoom in what happens in the soil interface, we call this the surface of the earth at watersheds from the, the top of the trees, if we have trees, to the bedrock, the critical zone. And we, it's critical because so many reactions happen there. And one of the reactions that happens is the weathering of rocks. And so as these rainwaters bearing carbonic acid infiltrate into the soils and dissolve the rock, they create clays, and clays don't have any second or any reactive components in them that contribute to, to um, neutralizing the CO2. And so the thing that's really important about keeping this weathering reactor going is that we have erosion at the Earth's surface. And so we need to remove those clays that have formed over time so we can continue to dissolve the fresh rock below. And so erosion is really important. So if you think about what happened when we broke up Rodinia, we actually probably created a lot of mountains and watersheds. And so we had erosion removing all of this weathered residue and keeping weathering reactions going. And so we didn't have land plants, so we know that erosion and sediment transport was really different in this period of Earth. And this is a picture from Iceland, but it may have looked something like this with big braided rivers carrying lots of sediment uh, to the oceans. And as a result of that, weathering reactions would have benefited from access to these fresh minerals. And so the simple analogy I like to give for how this process works, we have volcanoes emitting CO2 and rivers effectively converting it to bicarbonate so it can be buried as limestone, is as a system with a broken thermostat. And if you've been to Iceland, has anyone here been to Iceland? Oh yeah, lots of people, okay. So if you've been to the older buildings in Iceland that are heated with geothermal, they don't really have a thermostat for the geothermal, they just pump out heat. And the way that you get the room to the temperature you want is you just open the window. <laughs> it's very high tech. And that's how Earth works, right? Our volcanoes spew out CO2, they're trying to heat up the atmosphere, and the watersheds on the planet are basically like opening the windows. They're taking that CO2, converting it to alkalinity, and directing it to the oceans. And it turns out that the rate at which they can do that depends on how much CO2 is in the atmosphere. So they do that process more quickly if you have more CO2 to react with. And so this process of basically hacking a broken thermostat is, can be translated mathematically into a, a sort of simple concept. And I'll walk you through this plot and we'll see it a couple times. And so we call this the negative feedback in the silicate carbonate cycle because as you increase CO2, the weathering reactions correspond. And at some point you reach a steady state where the atmospheric concentration is set by the balance between the inputs, which are the volcanoes, and the outputs, which are these rocks taking up CO2. And so the way that we got into a snowball earth and the way that we got out of the snowball earth is shown here. And so if we started at point three, which would, let's assume this was the boring billion years, this is the curve that corresponds to the rate of weathering as a function of the atmospheric CO2 levels. And so where these two curves intersect means that the rate of removal of carbon by weathering processes in the watersheds is equal to the rate that's being put into the system by volcanoes. So when those things match, this is what sets our CO2 level. So if we started in a normal boring billion kind of paradigm, we broke up the continents, we had a bunch of weathering, we shifted from this curve to this curve over here, which is much steeper, right? So the Earth is much more, has much more capacity to rapidly remove carbon, carbon or CO2 from the system. So that puts us into the snowball. We're stuck in the snowball, and what happens in a snowball event is that we don't have any more liquid water, and so our watersheds aren't doing anything. They're not able to actually process the CO2 that's in the atmosphere. And so what we think happened is that we built up, we were here, we built up tons of CO2 in the atmosphere because weathering was so inefficient. There was just no chemical weathering happening on the planet at the time. And so it was that process of shutting off the weathering reactor, allowing CO2 to build up to quite high levels in the atmosphere that finally pushed us over this tipping point and enabled the ice to start melting. And so that's what kept us out of a permanent snowball state is um, the accumulation of CO2 from the volcanoes in the atmosphere. So as the ice melted, we probably shifted back to this middle curve three, which is a more normal state. And so the next question is, that's how watersheds got us into and out of the snowball earth event. What happened to life? And so life during this period was very simple. It was mostly like blue, blue or green algae, red algae, cyanobacteria. And as far as we can tell from what little records we have, it survived. And so how did it survive? 
One thing that people noticed recently is if you look at Antarctica, there are often these melt ice pools called cryocytes, and they tend to have algae living in them. And so one idea is that you know, Earth at least had enough liquid water that algae persisted in these pools of meltwater at the Earth's surface. There's a debate about whether Earth was not necessarily a snowball, but more of a like slush ball. So if you had a slush ball Earth, you might have had organisms that could have survived at the, in the, at the equator in, in areas of open water. That's still an active debate. Um, so, but life made it. And things started to change pretty markedly at this point. And so up until the snowball Earth, the oceans had very low oxygen levels. So they're what we call, they were anoxic oceans. And so one of the questions we want to know is when did the oxygen start coming into the oceans? And so our group has looked at using uranium isotopes. And we're not interested in the radioactive properties of uranium, but we're interested in the two isotopes. And so the isotopes of uranium are 238 and 235. So they have a different number of, of uh, neutrons. And so as a result of that, their nucleus is shaped slightly different, and it ends up having a consequence on the reaction. So one isotope reacts faster than the other. It's just a weird feature having to do with the the um, high mass of uranium. And so what we can do is measure those isotopes of uranium in the rocks. And because the uranium-238 tends to be more reactive than the other one, what we can look at is the consequences of that for seawater. And it turns out that those isotope ratios tell us the fraction of the seafloor that was anoxic. And that's the number we really want to know, right? Um, and so the y-axis here is the fraction of the seafloor that was anoxic. In today, today's world, I think it's about 0.01%. Um, but back then, so this is after the first glaciation, we actually oxygenated the oceans because we had all of this fresh glacial meltwater coming into the oceans. And so that was the f one of the first times we think that the Earth's ocean has actually been oxygenated. And then as time proceeded and we started to head into the second glacial event or ice ball event, snowball event, uh, the oceans returned to being anoxic. And so this was one of the first um, clues that, that has been put forward about the fact that the oceans might have been really changing in terms of the oxic, anoxic proportion. And the introduction of oxygen into the oceans has been pretty important because it helped us shepherd us into a really important phase for life. And so this is just an amazing virtual reality reconstruction of a Cambrian critter. It's super weird looking. It looks like it belongs on another planet, but it actually lived on Earth 500 million years ago. This is Obabina, and he's got this weird little trunk snout with, I don't even know what the things are on the end, but he's fascinating looking. Um, so this was made by BBC. And so the Cambrian explosion was important for animals. This was the first appearance of animals. It was also important for the carbon cycle, and I'll tell you why in a slide, but I just want to introduce you to some of these critters because they're pretty interesting. Um, so one of the things that started to happen during the Cambrian is that we had these, these top predators, and this is Anomalocaris, which people think might have been as big as one to two meters. So he was a big top predator. Um, because of predation, animals started to develop defense from predation. So this is a creature called hallucinogenia who started to develop these spikes as a defense against, against predation. And we got eyes. So trilobites are known for their eyes. They have lenses of calcium carbonate, up to 1,000 lenses in their eyes. So they have amazing eyes that they developed, and also exoskeletons. And so this set off basically what was an arms race among animals to be able to uh, survive predation. And it fundamentally changed the carbon cycle in an irreversible way. And it gave us what we call the biological pump. Many of people have probably heard about this for modern oceans, the importance of the biological pump. Um, it also gave us the organic carbon subcycle, which started the accumulation of fossil fuels. And the way that the biological pump work is as organisms started to get bigger, they started to sink. And so what this did was bring nutrients deeper into the ocean so more organisms could inhabit that part of the ocean. And so it allowed more productivity in the oceans. It also resulted in carbon getting buried in the sediments. And so that's what led to the accumulation, started the accumulation of fossil fuels was the fact that you were now able to bury carbon instead of all of the carbon associated with phytoplankton just being circulated at the surface. Uh, and the other thing that happened is bioturbation of the sediment. And so we started to get a lot of aerobic 
um, respiration happening, whereas most of the metabolisms that existed on Earth did not use oxygen. And so this shift to using oxygen for an aerobic metabolism was another big change for the planet. So we're going to advance forward in time to the next kind of period of a supercontinent. This is Pangaea, and this is the supercontinent Pangaea. Here's Utah over here underwater. <laughs> And we'll send our probe back down to the surface of the planet. And what we, what we would see is that things were not looking so good in the Permian. This is a re reconstruction, an artist reconstruction of what the Permian might have looked like. And you can see we have volcanoes erupting, forest fires, things are dying. Indeed, 90% of marine life went extinct at the Permian-Triassic boundary. And you can see that we have gases coming up from the seafloor. This was probably hydrogen sulfide, so the oceans had gone anaerobic or anoxic again. So the Permian was not a pretty time for Earth and its organisms. And what caused it? So we had the snowball Earth, which was running out of CO2. And in this particular case, we now have a problem of excess CO2. So it was the accumulation of excess CO2 that caused the Permian mass extinction. So how do we end up with excess CO2? Our, it's our friends, the volcanoes, at it again. And so this is a paleogeographic reconstruction of Pangaea. The numbers here are just showing where important uh, records exist for the Permian Triassic. And here in Siberia, the Siberian traps erupted. It, it's estimated that it was about two to four million cubic kilometers of lava. So this is one of the biggest eruptions that ever happened in Earth history. It's called a large igneous, process, large igneous province. So it was an enormous volcanic eruption. And it was unfortunate, not only because it was enormous, but it also happened to erupt on top of coal and sedimentary rocks. And so as that lava poured out onto the coal, it heated it up, and it caused all sorts of volatilization of carbon to the atmosphere. And so it was a massive carbon release from volcanoes effectively burning coal. And the CO2 that went into the atmosphere acidified rainfall. We had acid rainfall on the terrestrial environments. It's a bit debated how much of the terrestrial environment was affected by the Permian Triassic, it was really a marine um, extinction. And we sent a lot of nutrients into the oceans from both the acid rain dissolving the rocks and um, the, the ash and other things that were coming from the volcanoes. And so if we send, now we have all of this oxygen at oxygenic respiration. If we send a lot of nutrients into the ocean, that means that we pull a bunch of oxygen out through the organisms that are living there. And so that caused the oceans to become very anoxic. The LMZ here is the oxygen minimum zone. Um, so we had ocean acidification, ocean anoxia, acid rainfall, and probably a lot of uh, methane in the atmosphere. So it was not a particularly fun period. And, but it does tell us one thing about how the carbon cycle works. And so I told you how weathering can shift the carbon cycle from moving these gray curves around. But the other thing that we can do to change atmospheric CO2 is just increase the input of carbon to the atmosphere, in this case by volcanic emissions. And so here I've just shown this schematically for you. If we started with the green line and move up to the red line, which is what happened due to the Permian volcanism, we would go from a normal here to the new intersection between the curves and arrive at the end Permian mass extinction. And the, the <coughs> evolution of the ocean, again, played a really important role for life, but it took a really long time to recover from this extinction. So this is, again, our friends, the uranium isotopes, um, work done by a student in our group, Kim Lau. And what we did was look at all the rocks going from about 251 to 253 million years, so this interval um, around the Permian-Triassic extinction. And again, we see this shift from high anoxia. Uh, sorry, this is going the other way. Sorry, low anoxia before the extinction to high anoxia during the extinction interval. And then we go through this kind of very slow recovery where we get back to conditions. There's a lot of scatter. This has to do with where the rocks were um, relative to the, the shoreline. 
Um, but we see this, this excursion into marine anoxia and then this fairly slow recovery. And so we think that this delayed the recovery from the extinction um, because of the prolong prolonged anoxia. And so it turns out if we look at most of the big five extinctions that have happened, they've been caused by a range of things. So most people are familiar with the, the bolide impact that killed the dinosaurs. Um, but we had the end Permian that was due to volcanism, the end Ordovician, which was due to glaciation and cooling. And so many of these mass extinction events have been caused by very severe disruptions of the carbon cycle. And you know, it's now thought for the, uh, the end Triassic that one of the another ma major factor would have been ocean acidification. So ocean acidification, marine anoxia, and then excess cooling are bit some of the big factors that have driven these mass extinctions. So we've gone from runaway ice house, snowball earth, runaway greenhouse, Permian earth. How do we end up with a stable earth? Earth today in the last 50 million years has been pretty stable climatically compared to these really big upheavals we've seen in the past. So I want to take you through that last part um, and really dig into you know, how have we gone from the end Permian, which might have been here, to Cretaceous, to pre-industrial today. And the idea is that the strength of the silicate weathering feedback has gotten much, much stronger over the last 400 million years. So what happened in the last 400 million years to do this? And one of the big things was the development of vascular plants. And this is shown here. This is um, just a, a, the time is here. And this is showing the, the different plants. And so I'm just, I've just kind of marked. And the Devonian was when we started to get the appearance of the first vascular plants. And then angiosperms came in much later, um, closer to the Cenozoic, so 65 million years ago. And so it was at least in my opinion, it was this development of vascular plants at the Earth's surface that really fundamentally, again, changed the carbon cycle. So at first it was the Cambrian explosion, now it's the, Cam the, the Bonian explosion on land. And I'll explain why we think that happened, why we think plant, land plants had such a fundamental effect on the carbon cycle. And so this is some of the plants that, uh, if I go back here, we're not going back. There we go. Um, so I'm showing the progymnosperms, the lycopsids here. And so this is one of the original early plants. It was not a vascular plant. It was like a club, more like a club moss. And so it did not have a deep rooting structure. Um, and over time, plants to start, started to develop rooting structures. And we get to the progymnosperms, which had very extensive rooting structures. And now they're going down deep into the rock. They may be breaking the rock apart. Everyone's probably seen those amazing pictures of tree roots going into rocks. And it's kind of amazing sometimes when you look at trees, the kinds of environments they can live in. And so these roots going down into the rock, of course, trees respire CO2. And it increases the amount of weathering that happens in the soils and at the bedrock surface. And so we think that trees probably both deepened or rooted plants deepened the weathering zone, but also made weathering much more efficient because they were taking CO2 and pumping it into the soils and, and bedrock interface. And so just to give you a sense for, you know, if we look at modern soils today and we look at the CO2 levels in those soils, so it's typically on the order of 20,000 ppm CO2 in the soil environment. So it would be toxic to humans if we lived in the soil. Um, so there's quite amount of CO2 being pumped into the soils by plants. And so fundamentally what the plants have done is just increase the rate at which CO2, so in the protozoic we had CO2 dissolved in rainwater and it was running through the rocks. Today we have trees taking the CO2, fixing it, and then pumping it back underground where it's dissolving with the rocks. So we've really accelerated that transfer of CO2 through the system. And so one of the questions is, well, you know, what evidence do we have that, that this whole process, that the feedback has gotten stronger and that it's really what's maintaining this balance of CO2 over million year time scales? And what we can do is look for the imbalance between our silicate weathering curve and our volcanoes, right? If those, we think those should be perfectly balanced if the feedback is working. And so if they're not in balance, then there's something else going on. 
And so working with some students, we were able to do this, and we found that over the last 55 million years of Earth history, the flux, these fluxes have been within 2% of each other, which is a really amazing balance, especially given the error that we have on those estimates. And so it suggests that there is indeed a very strongly regulated feedback and we haven't, I won't show you the plot, the other thing that we've seen is that throughout the last 55 million years, the feedback has continued to get stronger, particularly as we see angiosperms coming online. And so the thing that the feedback has done has set CO2 levels to lower and lower levels throughout the last 65 million years. The second aspect of having a really strong feedback silicate weathering feedback, is that it makes the Earth less, sus less susceptible to major carbon cycle perturbations. And so if you have a strong feedback as we have today, carbon cycle perturbations are removed from the ocean atmosphere system very quickly. And so they may not even be recorded effectively in the geologic record because the carbon is processed through the rivers and the ocean system so fast. Um, conversely, if you have a weak feedback, you have much longer recovery from a carbon cycle perturbation. Uh, and so these high atmospheric levels persist for much longer, and this is much more likely to be recorded in the geologic record. So we're actually in a good place in terms of being able to process changes in carbon in the Earth's surface. And these aspects of the Earth's Earth cycles, these different planetary states, snowball Earth, greenhouse Earth, stable Earth, help us to understand whether we might find other planets like Earth. So if we see a snowball Earth planet, we can actually start to use models based on Earth to understand what the history of that planet might be and whether it's likely that it might come out of a snowball. And so I just thought it was interesting to look at this plot. This is uh, showing the starlight on the planet relative to Earth and the temperature of the stars. And so you can see that we've actually, through a number of different missions, found a lot of planet, exoplanets that fall in this sort of conservative habitable, habitable zone. So it's likely that there could be water at the Earth's surface. And so it'll be exciting to see what happens in the next few years as we start to build more information out about what's actually going on on these planets. But the critical thing that we look for is the presence of liquid water. And if we find liquid water, our next question is, does the planet have a carbon cycle? And if it does, then it starts to look pretty good for an Earth-like planet. So just to, to wrap up this, this introduction to the different ways in which we can change the planetary state and how some of these different biological inventions over time have, have really changed the carbon cycle irreversibly, most of the extinctions and um, carbon cycle perturbations were often caused by this intersection of geologic agents, the volcanoes, bolides, and watersheds. What was going on in watersheds was really important for setting um, how the Earth responded to these carbon cycle perturbations. And these bio biotic responses led to irreversible changes in the carbon cycle that have helped us to gain greater climate stability over time. So we've opened the windows to a greater extent than we had before. So that brings us to the, the last part of this, the Anthropocene, our fourth planet that we're going to explore. Um, and of course, this is what they call the, blue, or the black marble, um, Earth from space, NASA image. And I think it's useful now that we've gone through this to think about how do humans compare as geologic agents. We've seen volcanoes as, as one example. And so now I'm bringing up uh, the modern carbon cycle so we have about 4,000 petagrams of carbon in soils. Uh, 2,000 petagrams of carbon are in extractable fossil fuel reserves. There's another probably two to 4,000 petagrams of, of organic carbon in sedimentary rocks that we just don't think is extractable as a reserve. Um, and then, of course, just the Earth's crust is enormous. So those are the reservoirs we have of carbon uh, in the terrestrial side. Plants are about 560 petagrams of carbon. The atmosphere is up here at 860, so plants and atmosphere are about the same size of carbon. And now I've layered on the biosphere. And so plants take up an enormous amount of carbon, 120 petagrams per year. Half of the, that goes back through respiration. The other half is returned to the atmosphere through decomposition in the soil, from microorganisms living in the soil. And so the thing that you can notice here immediately is that 
this is a pretty small reservoir compared to the size of the soils. The soils are enormous. And so what happens with soils and what happens with decomposition is a really important lever on the carbon cycle. And so when you hear discussions of land change, that fear about what's going to happen with soil carbon is, is one of the reasons this imbalance or big difference between the reservoirs is one reason why soils are so important. What else did I want to say? You can also notice that the biosphere is much, much larger than the volcanoes much more carbon cycling through the system. And so if we add humans on here, this is now the um, uptake, the net uptake from the land surface, and then the total emissions from fossil fuel burning are about on the order of 10 gigatons. So 10 um, compared to 120 compared to 0.1. And then currently the land surface and the ocean are doing a lot to take up that excess carbon that is going into the atmosphere. So we have about 2.5 uh, petagrams going into the ocean and 2.4 being taken up by land. So about half the carbon that's being emitted right now is being taken back up by land and ocean processes. And so what this tells us, if you think about the geologic carbon cycle and the fact that one of the major perturbations we saw with volcanoes is that, you know, effectively, if volcanoes and the weathering that balances them out is the long-term geologic sink, we're about the equivalent of 80 volcanic, 80, vo 80 times volcanic emissions. And so this is our one volcano, and this is humans here with 80 volcanoes lined up next to them. So that's one way to, to really think about the impact that, that uh, humans are having on the planet. And you know, I think the question is, what happens next? And, you know, I think most scientists would, would oops. Of course, it stalls at the important moment. <laughs> oops, let's go this way. What's going on here? Oh, <laughs> that's why. Okay. You know, I think many scientists would end the talk here, and I, I just felt like I, I wanted to say a little bit more, so this kind of trends into my own personal opinion and thoughts on things. So I'm going to keep going um, into this question of what happens next. And, you know, one of the things that I think is important to keep in mind, it's very easy to get depressed about the fact that humans are 80 times volcanoes. But, you know, the other flip side of that is that we have succeeded at planetary scale interventions in the past. And, you know, we came together, we decided that the ozone hole was a problem, and we came together and fixed it, and are close to fixing it. Um, Last year, 2019, the ozone hole was the smallest it's ever been on record. So, you know, that's a, that's a positive sign that we can, we can engage in planetary scale interventions. Um, you know, we've solved acid rain. That was a big problem. We did a great job of coming together and, and um, passing legislation to prevent and ameliorate acid rain. And then we've also succeeded, for the most part, at least I hope, at avoiding nuclear apocalypse. Um, starting with the Russian treaty in 1973, we've been able to um, continue to manage a nuclear arsenal, which is probably one of the you know, biggest existential threats to the, the planet we could have. So there is some evidence that we've been able to come together for planetary scale interventions. And this is interesting to me because it suggests that maybe we're living in a really interesting time for how humans relate to the planet, which might explain why there's so much tension and friction around climate change as a, as a problem. And so Robert J. Lifton proposed this idea that we're actually in the middle of what he calls the great climate swerve. And his idea is that, you know, for, for most of human history, we were vulnerable to things like volcanic eruptions, storms, and so humans developed this myth around um, the, the gods being responsible for changing the planet and negatively impacting us. But we're now at a point where we're shifting to realizing that we can actually influence the planet at these large scales. And so he calls that the great swerve, this collective recognition that humans have the ability to control and influence planetary scale processes. And so I like this idea, and it's hard to find evidence for it sometimes, but you know, I think it's interesting to look at fossil fuel CO2 emissions over you know, the last uh, 50 years. And you know, if you look at it all together, it doesn't look so promising, but then you can start to see you know, the US had a major, has, well not major, but we've had declining emissions um, for the last few years. A lot of that was driven by uh, fossil fuel stationary source um, 
regulations, the EU has seen a decrease as well from shifting to renewables. China, most of China's increase has been from coal, and so they've sort of stabilized, which is at least a good sign. So there's promise to see in these numbers that humans are, we are trying to respond to this planetary scale emergency. And, you know, so I think that as we start to have these conversations about how do we go through a swerve, how do we think about the tensions that exist around adapting to climate change, I think a lot of times there's very much a uh, one-size-fits-all type of approach, and I think the other question is to think about if we're going to go through this process of, of trying to enact a planetary scale intervention, how do we fix other problems that we have, right? We have a lot of other problems and often they're coupled but we don't necessarily see that. And so I like phrasing the question as how can we use our understanding and knowledge to not only solve the problem of climate change, but also just enable a better future for both humans and the planet. And I think if we start to think about fixing things together collectively, um, it enables the potential for solutions to move forward more quickly. And I'm really hopeful there are a lot of great solutions, technological solutions, um, different innovations that people have come up with. We have the technology to solve the problem, we just need to figure out how to do it in a collective way. And so with that, I want to close. This is a picture of a hot spring environment, which may have been one of the early environments that hosted life. And hope that you will ask me lots of questions. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. <laughs>'Cause so I think that's a, a, a fantastic question. So the way that you can think about what will happen to, you know, if we do nothing but eventually we run out of fossil fuels and we stop emitting CO2 for some reason, um, the current CO2 that we have in the ocean atmosphere system, it will take probably around 500,000 years to be run through the weathering reactor, circled back through the oceans and buried as limestone. So we will process all of the excess carbon that we have put into the atmosphere, but it'll take a couple hundred thousand years to do that. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the other piece of that equation is what happens with weathering. And we have so changed the Earth's surface that it's not clear whether we have actually changed the strength of that feedback in a positive way or a negative way. So, you know, that, that, that lever of will the watersheds continue to process carbon um, will change, might change that from 500,000 years to 700,000 years if we can't process as much carbon through the, the you know, the, the watersheds and CO2 pipeline. If, you know, I think beyond about a million years, it's really hard to predict what the earth will look like because there's so many other factors that, that come into play. But, you know, certainly just from a very simple, almost mathematical approach, um, we will process all of that carbon, but it will take a very long time. Yeah. Other questions? Go ahead and raise hands and I'll try to navigate to people. I'm going to get this one, then I'll come get you. Fantastic. Uh, I want to say um, this is a fantastic talk. It's a very timely topic, and I think uh, we can all be very grateful that we're here at such a challenging time and still, uh, still around to get involved. Uh, 
and I'm sure we're all working on wonderful solutions, um, but I wonder what some solutions that you may have come up with or may have come across your horizon that would not just increase the quality of life, but also mitigate some of this problem. Yeah, so, I, you know, and again, I think that one of my concerns about the dialogue we're having about this, at least on the academic side, is that it tends to be like, we need to do it all with wind, we need to do it all with solar, we need to do it all with, you know, nuclear. And I think that we need to think about what makes sense at a more regional to state level. Um, and so, you know, we, we have, Utah is actually doing a pretty good job with renewables. Um, you know, California and the West, we have now have periods where the grid is negative because we have so much solar energy. And so, you know, I think that renewables certainly are important, um, but we will have to do something, I think, to get to negative emissions, which is more extreme. And, and you know, most likely to me, that seems like a carbon capture where you capture the, the CO2 at the power plant and you, pipe it to somewhere, compress it, and inject it underground as a geologic carbon storage strategy. And we, you know, we've been getting oil and gas out of the ground for a long time, and we've actually been pumping CO2 underground to get more oil and gas out. So we have the technology. We've been studying for a very long time how to put CO2 underground. So I think that's an option in certain places. Um, you know, and I, but I really also like the, oh, and I, and I was gonna say the third major one is, is um, nature-based solutions, which is basically blue carbon, so you know more carbon in um, estuarine environments as well as planting more trees and really building up the carbon stocks. Um, so those are kind of, I would say, the mainstream solutions, renewable CCS and um, uh, nature-based solutions. But I also like the, the drawdown, project drawdown approach. I don't know if people have seen drawdown, but you can go to their website and they go through, I mean, they must now have like 80 different climate solutions. And you can kind of think about, okay, well this one, I'm interested in this one, how can I explore this? Could this be right for our local community or this, this um, uh, part of the country I live in? And so it kind of gives you this really big portfolio. And I also like that approach to really thinking about it, what makes sense, um, bringing the solutions to people instead of instead of kind of forcing them at large levels. So I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, no, actually I'll say one more thing about that, which also gives me hope is that there are some, you know, people coming up with pretty clever ideas. And we were talking earlier that there's a, a startup I saw a presentation from the other day that has figured out how to take CO2 and make, make carbon monoxide out of it. And so they can use carbon monoxide to make things like suitcases, like clickers, water bottles, all sorts of things. And so it's a way to just close the loop and recycle the CO2 back into products. And so there's interesting innovations going on all over the place to come up with these ideas that, that start to make a difference. And so it's just getting those to scale and, and seeing that happen, I think will be exciting. Uh, so, just in terms of understanding, you mentioned that the, uh, uh, in the Proterozoic uh, phase, the ocean was largely an anoxic, but we had the big oxygenation, which apparently must have taken place from mm -hmm. bacteria, cyanobacteria that lived in the ocean. So, how, uh, how, why was it anoxic? Great question. Yeah, so it was really the, the atmosphere that was oxygenated, and because we did not yet have... Um, uh, that we hadn't, we didn't have the animals of the Cambrian um, effectively, didn't have a way to oxygenate the ocean. So you were, uh, you were consuming all of the oxygen at the surface from, you know, the algae that were living there. And so we didn't have a way to accumulate oxygen in the deep ocean. So they were basically anaerobic for a long period of Earth history until we really started to get um, more circulation of the ocean and more transport of of um, material to the deep away from the surface, right? Because oxygen, getting oxygen into the ocean is difficult. Um, and so if you consume it all at the top, you can just never get it down. But if you're consuming it more slowly, then you can actually get oxygen into the ocean more effectively, if that makes sense. Hello, hi, uh, here. So uh, I have a question about how you might counter an argument where internal geological history um, right now, we're, st we're still relatively low c CO2, right? And then if you look at uh, EOSIN, PTM, that's way higher rate and way higher concentration of carbon dioxide. So in terms of ex existential crisis-wise, life will be able to persist in, at that level, right? And then some people might use that as an argument for, like, what, aside, why don't we just focus on economically, right? right. That's just 
focus on all the damage it can do, and then but will be will still exist. So how how might you counter that? Yeah, I think you know I think that's a, a new argument that's becoming more and more frequent, um, and I, I think that we're already seeing the bad effects from warming. And you know I live in California. We've had two years now of just horrendous forest fires. Um, you know, the, the increase in hurricanes, um, you know, you can just take a step back and look at just the massive um, numbers of, of these events that we're seeing. And it's already starting to get bad. We already know that we're seeing glaciers melting. And, you know, and so I think the question is, you know, if, if, if economics, if economic well-being is your only goal, then I think looking at the economics of responding to all of these disasters and the price of adaptation, what that would look like, I think that it still starts to make pretty massive response to climate change look much more attractive <laughs> as a as an economic option. Um, and then I think there's just an ethical and moral issue that's that that each person has to decide on their own of what is our obligation to future generations, what's the world we want to hand off to our children, and that one, you know, that one's harder. But I think that's something that everyone has to think about on their own. So, so uh, about 10, 12,000 years ago, about half of the um, North America and virtually all of Europe was covered in glacial ice up to about 10,000 feet. Um, is this part of the stable period that you're talking about? And, and how, if you, if you bring the carbon dioxide level down to the ideal, whatever that might be, 350 parts per million or whatever. Um, how, do you, how do you know you're not going to go back into these glacial advances and retreats? Um, yes, yeah, so, so let me ask for one clarification. Your question is, how do we know that if we start to, to reduce CO2 in the atmosphere, we won't go back into a glacial event? Yeah. So I, I'm, not a, I'm not a climate modeler. Um, I think if I, if I were a climate modeler or could channel what a climate modeler would say is that um, we're a long way from getting back to CO2 levels that would bring us anywhere close to um, reaching an ice age type of, or you know, it, having an increase in, in, in glaciation. Um, partly because we've built up so much thermal heat in the oceans that it takes, you know, there's a, there's a momentum in the system that even if we went to zero emissions tomorrow, we would still be seeing the effects for probably 50 to 100 years just from the, the thermal heat that's built up. Um, so I don't think that there's any risk that we will plunge back into a glaciation within, you know, the next several hundred thousand years until we get a lot of the carbon removed from the system. It's more of a question of can we, you know, can we stabilize temperature at around one and a half degrees, two degrees, and what does that look like for ecosystems and oceans and things like that? Th 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 this kind of builds on that question. Okay. Um, we've heard about geoengineering approaches to solving the problem. Yeah. Okay. You didn't mention that, and I'm surprised that it hasn't been brought up yet because it's a technological so-called fix for the problem, but you talked about planetary in interventions. Mm -hmm. Would this, in your view, be a wise or a stupid uh, planetary <laughs> intervention? Wow, putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> so I, I actually recently learned that Lyndon Johnson requested a report on climate change, and the climate scientists, even back then, recognized that climate change was a problem. And one of their solutions was one I hadn't heard of, which was to sprinkle reflective particles all over the oceans. Um, and you know, some of these other geoengineering strat strategies, you know, I think you're talking about, is to you know put aerosols into the atmosphere. Um, there's the like giant reflecting mirrors. I mean, there's a lot of ideas. My personal opinion, and so I, and I separate those. Some people call geologic carbon sequestration geoengineering, but I think it, it's in a different category from those solutions. It's much more something that we've already done and have experience with. My feeling is that we've already done a planetary scale experiment, and we've done it pretty knowingly, and it's not looking so great, and that doing a second planetary scale experiment is um, probably not such a great idea. But, but my big concern is that we're not doing enough research on these strategies, and we really should be, because what if China or India decides that they want to employ one of these strategies, and we have no idea what would happen, how it might change global rainfall patterns, um, all of those things. And so even though I, I, I'm skeptical that any of them will turn out to be the magic bullet, I think that, or the silver bullet, I think that we actually should really be putting a lot of research into these ideas for that reason. <laughs> 
Um, so I have a question that goes into a little bit into ethical territory, maybe. Uh, so I'm from Germany, and a lot in the, in the German discussion, uh, a lot of times what comes up is, or from so-called climate skeptics, is that they say, well, you know, we only account for 2% of the global emissions, so whatever we do, the effect is going to be minimal. Whereupon I then always say, well, that's one way that you're looking at the current flux, but if you look at all the carbon that's already in the atmosphere, yeah. it's much more than that, right? I don't know exactly, it's about 16% or something like that. So we, so I was wondering how I can counter that argument efficiently saying, you know, there is a sort of responsibility for all the warming that's already happening that puts a special burden on us to, to uh, make up for that, so to say. Is that, can you speak to that, how, how to convince people like that? <laughs> I'm definitely not an expert on dealing with climate skeptics. I will say that if people know Catherine Hayhoe, she um, is a climate scientist and just an incredible communicator. She's one of my idols. And she does these global weirding episodes. And I'm pretty sure she has one on, on this topic. I, you know, I, I think your point is very good that um, you know, we have historically there's accumulative emissions that are built into different countries, and that's one of the the you know the, the political arguments that comes up. I don't have a good answer for you as to how to combat that, but I bet Catherine does because she she's thought a lot about some of those different skeptic arguments. Yeah. So the, the people that are going to be impacted the most are the young folks. Any young people that want to ask questions? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> This question is kind of unrelated, but you were talking about how when we are looking at exoplanets, possible like Earth similar, um, we would look for carbon cycle and the possibility of water. Um, how do you think that, or we found recently that Titan has a methane cycle. Do you think that could also be a possible model, possible Earth-like climate? Or how is that related to like what we already understand about the carbon cycle? Sure. So I should say I have enough trouble understanding Earth that I don't know very much about exoplanets. Um, the, you know, the ways, and, and Titan people are excited about Titan, the ways that people look for signatures of life, so once we find a planet, then the question is what's in its atmosphere, and the ways that people look for signatures of life are to look for things that are out of equilibrium in the atmosphere. So if you look at Earth's atmosphere, we have CO2, but we also have methane, and we have N2O. And so th not, those are not in thermodynamic equilibrium in the atmosphere. And so they, that's assumed that that's basically suggestive of life. Um, methane is more tricky because there are lots of ways to produce methane um, abiotically. And you know, so it's not necessarily clear that you know, methane in and of itself is a signature of life and you know so that's one that's particularly tricky and controversial controversial um, but that is you know one thing that people look for is the composition of the atmosphere as a signature of of life which is you know about the best we can probably do at this point if we can get spectroscopic information yeah oh, one, more one more question at least get yeah, maybe two okay so a lot of the solutions you talked about are very large scale and as youth we feel like we have pretty much no influence on that whatsoever. Yes. I mean, there's like the pop culture, don't use straws or whatever, and that's great. But I'm thinking about <laughs> what we can do as individuals as we're leaving. What do you hope from us, like contacting politicians? How do we convey how important it is for us, for them to make changes? How do we, like, what do you suggest we do when we leave this room? What do you hope for? Wow, that's a fantastic question. I, first of all, have loved and been so inspired by like Greta and just the youth movements that have already started. And I would personally love to see more of that. Just these prote you know, protests, get out there and make noise and make your voices heard. Um, I think in terms of you know, moving from there into more effective strategies, at least in my opinion, with the sort of current political climate we have, I do feel like cities and states are a really effective vessel for getting them to start to think about what might they do. And I think figuring out how to engage with that process of who's getting elected at the state level and, and what are the policies that are being made even at the, the town and city level, I think is one way that I would encourage people to get engaged because it starts to help you understand also just the, the levers in the system and sometimes how difficult the the change can be, and and I would also say to think about how you know back to the last question I asked is, you know how can you 
focus on other problems and use them as a way to say, okay, what if we, transportation is a problem, our city is clogged, we have affordability problems, these are all big topics in California. If we went to some sort of public transportation system that would reduce CO2 emissions, but also fix a lot of other problems we're struggling with. And so I think that packaging of how can we fix other problems by, and also address climate change at the same time is also, I think, in my opinion, a fruitful way forward, but is right now getting lost in the message because there tends to be so much um, what I call climate shaming, like, oh, don't fly, don't eat meat, and it's like, okay, well, yes, we should not do those things, but we also have a lot of things that we have the opportunity to fix, and I think fo focusing on the positive things that we can do is helpful. Um, earlier in your presentation, you mentioned that you were able to track the anoxidation of the um, seafloors by comparing uranium-238 and 235. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on how that uh, reaction mechanism actually works. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so what happens um, is that uranium, when it's in the oceans and seawater, there's a little bit of uranium there. Not much, but there's some because it's just naturally occurring in the rocks. And so it's in the six plus valence state. And when uranium is reduced, so it's soluble in seawater, when uranium is reduced from the plus six, it forms a plus four ion, which is actually very insoluble, so it precipitates out. And so what happens is that when you start to have a C4 that's um, anoxic, and so the other thing about uranium is that it's very, the reaction is kinetically limited, so it doesn't happen in the water column, it has to happen in the sediments. And so what happens is that as the uranium is reduced at the sediment water interface, you start to pull the 238 out of, you diffuse more 238 out of seawater than 235, and so it causes the seawater to become isotopically depleted. And so what we do is instead of measuring the sediments that have the reduced uranium, we find the carbonates that are just recording what seawater looked like. And so we're looking at the records from the carbonate rocks that are just giving us this sort of well-mixed ocean signal of uranium. And so then we can use a simple mass balance model to figure out, okay, if this much uranium went into the sediments, how does that correspond to the fraction of the seafloor? Yeah. Okay, I think with that, we'll thank <laughs> Dr. Miller um, for solving all our problems. <laughs> so.